we decided to do it by sound a helicopter from uh, Sawan. And she, we, we had a submachine gun and she pulled it out of the bag and uh, pointed the submachine gun at me. At least than six feet from the air, from the ground. I ran over and uh, as I ran, all the uh, screws see me and, uh, and the, the crews were playing football, they all stopped. Nobody could really believe what was happening. All that talk to my gang pulled up and we pull up and they all did. Yo, it's your boy King Dave here and this is the Felon Show. Hope all is going well out there. What's your name and where are you from, brother? Yeah, hi Dave. Uh, my name's John Killick and I'm out here in Sydney, Australia. Sydney, Australia. Big John Killick here. So uh, it's a big honour to have this guy um, on the show here. He's old school. So this man here, John Killick, um, is a former notorious bank robber. So he's robbed banks across Australia and is also a notorious prison escapee. So he's actually escaped from multiple prisons across Australia as well in New South Wales, including Bathurst, uh, Silverwater, and even in Melbourne, he um, attempted to escape from Pentridge Prison. Well, he's an author. He's um, had three three books um, about his life, um, and there's also a book coming out hopefully late January called The Voice of a Survivor, which will be featuring Russell Manser, who has also been on the show. Well, I mean, you escaped from Silverwater Jail in 1999 in a daring escape involving a helicopter. So I guess before that, um, you know, well, how old were you when that happened quickly? Uh, I was just about celebrating my 57th birthday. 57th birthday, yeah. wow. Jail kept you young. A bit late to be doing those things. Uh, <laughs> Jail kept but you I was pretty, fit, was pretty fit in those days. I used to train a lot, even then in those days. You know. Yep, yep. So, I mean, before all of that, man, so so, so where, well, where did you grow up, brother? I grew up, um, well, Balmain. Uh, went to school there in Fairfield. Um, the two areas are uh, totally different now. Balmain's become very trendy when, when I was there. Uh, it was uh, a pretty tough suburb, you know, work, certainly working man uh, suburb, but a lot of tough people there. And, uh, you know, I, I was adopted. Um, I was born during the middle of the war. Oh, and, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, and I, I never really knew, I ne never had a clue who my real parents were. And uh, unfortunately, uh, my father, the adopted father, was um, he, he was a good guy overall, but he used to get drunk and bad, he was a bad drunk. Uh, alcoholic and uh, he he could fight his next boxer and uh, he terrorized the neighborhoods wherever we went and uh, uh, you know he terrorized us um, you know and uh, that's when he was drunk in those days and uh, so it was it was pretty um, traumatic I, I used to sort of Friday nights sort of be in bed praying he wouldn't get home that he'd get arrested or something so we wouldn't have to go through it so you know my mother actually uh, she, she killed herself uh, I overdosed uh, when I was 17 and uh, I blamed dad for it and I said I'm leaving the very the very morning that she died and uh, he couldn't believe it and uh, he said you got to stay I said I'm not staying and uh, I packed bags I had nothing and walked out and uh, and left and went into a boarding house uh, and funny enough the very first night I stayed there I was had to share a room with uh, a guy who's a big wrestler and uh, He's made sexual advances towards me, and I, you know, I didn't know anything about it. You know, I was a pretty innocent kid, and uh, you know, I, I was really upset about that. So, because at the time I was grieving, and uh, so I sort of got a bit bitter. You know, I was bitter on the sort of that, that day that uh, Mum died. It was me against the world, really, um, and I hardened up. I hardened up. The the young guy, you know, used to read all the time and uh, never got in any trouble. Totally, totally different change came over me. And uh, I, I remember hooking up with a few guys a bit older than me and uh, learned a few few tricks uh, about shoplifting and stuff like that. And uh, then, then we did a break in Anna and I finished up um, at Long Bay when I was 17. Same, same as Russell. We both went to Long Bay when we were 17, uh, which we shouldn't have been there. But And I learned all the ropes there. It was very hard in those days. Uh, tough crims, tough conditions. You got, they put three men in a cell Three men in a cell. Uh, lights out at nine. You got no radio, no TV, no books. Um, you got no running water. You got a toilet in the in, in at the in in the corner, which suffices as a. As a um, you, you got a bucket, which suffices as a toilet. You three of you had to use this bucket, and you had a jug of water, 
And that was it. You were in there, uh, no sheets, just dirty blankets. And uh, in the middle of uh, summer, it was January and it was very hot. And I tell you what, it's, uh, you didn't get contact visits those days. You're lucky to get a visit once a month for 20 minutes. Uh, and that was talking through a wire fence, wire regard. Um, if you wrote a letter, you'd have to take it down one page, write it in ink, show the uh, officer, and he'd go, mm, 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 I don't know, I don't like that, rip it up, and go and write another one. You know? <laughs> I mean, right. it was the end of any relationship. If you were married or you had a re really good girlfriend, that was just about it. It was just about a death knob if you were in there for any amount of time. You know? So that's, um, that's where I was really, um, I would say, inculcated to become uh, a criminal. I uh, changed my code of ethics. And uh, as you well know, um, code of ethics uh, in jail is almost totally opposite to, uh, to the ones we've got outside, where, where um, inside, it, if, if you tell on somebody about anything, you know, you could, you could, your mate could get bashed by three guys. And if you go and tell the officers, you're a dog. You, you know, and I mean, it's just, and that's the way that it was sort of bred into me that um, you don't tell them um, you, uh, it's them against us. Uh, anything goes when you get out. It's, you, you can rob. If you're a good thief, you, then you're a top guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So naturally, everybody wanted to be uh, bank robbers. Ba bank robbers, uh, were very rare. The, the top echelon of criminals in those days were the safe breakers, who were pretty good, um, and had a, a skill, and bank robbers. Now, there are only a few bank robbers. This, you know, I, I tell it the way it is. I don't uh, exaggerate. I don't uh, fudge the figures. I, uh, I don't make excuses. I, I just tell it the way it was. And yeah. uh, I think in that respect that my books um, will sit well on, on the uh, true crime, in, in lives of true crime when, when I'm gone. Uh, this is probably the best one, the uh, the last escape. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's the book, my whole life story, and it's uh, very well known, and uh, people really like it. The first book covers my life up till seventy three, and I, it's it's had pretty literary acclaim. That one, gambling and, for love. Yep. Yeah, gambling for love, and uh, then the last one I did on the inside, um, just about thirty two stories, different. Uh, Criminals I met over the, over the years in, in a different systems, um, short stories, and I do think that the next book, um, the Russell Mann story, might very well be my best book. Look, brother. So um, going back a little bit, so how was your first um, stint in prison, man? Like, what what was it sort of like for you being a seventeen year old walking into Long Bay? <laughs> You're not going to believe. There, it. Was there many drugs in there and, and stuff like that? Uh, there was or? no drugs. That, see, that's the thing. In the sixties, uh, there weren't any drugs. There, there might have been a little bit of marijuana slipping in here and there, but uh, I didn't even know about it. But um, it was packed with uh, boredom, really. But I went in. We, I, my mate told me, look, it'll be fun in jail. He'd been the boys' home. He said, jail, that was better. And uh, he had me looking forward. <laughs> I know it's ridiculous, but in the back of the van saying, look, John, we'll be okay. And uh, well, I got a bit of a culture shock, believe me. Um, but... What, I was lucky that um, the two of us shared a cell with um, an old guy and he uh, taught us the ropes in Thailand. And, uh, you know, and then I, I got into a fight because there's nothing to do during the day and you just locked in the yard. And I got into a fight with a young German guy and uh, we're playing chess. And I, I, I'd, I'd, uh, a Russian guy taught me to play and uh, I, was, I was fairly good at chess. And uh, so I got the best of this Russian guy. It, the game wasn't quite over, but he was gone. And... <laughs> He just picked up the chessboard and whacked me over the head with it. <laughs> you know, so I jumped up and we were into it, into a fight. And uh, I eventually got the best of him. The, the screws saw the fight. I was told later and they walked away. That's what I used to do in those days. They'd, they'd walk it away and just let you, let you have it out. But these days, they can't do it. You'll only get 10 out of it or stabbed. You know, um, it's, it's a totally different ball game now. Yeah. But um, it, my mate came up to me later and... Um, and so did someone else said, John, it's just, that's good that you had that fight and showed you, you, you'll at least stand up for yourself because, um, you know, people know that there are easier marks than you. Because I was a young guy, 17, you know, uh, uh, very young looking. And, and, uh, and, but they said to me, look, just because you beat that guy, don't think you're, you're any good because uh, this guy is here to smash you to bits with one arm tied behind their back. And uh, if they ask you to go into their cell and come in for a cup of coffee to chat, you don't go because, um, you know, they, you're not that interesting. 
you know. So yeah. he drove it home to me. And this is very true. It was very true. Yeah. Were there any gangs and things like that? Um, and no that gangs. Time, or? No gangs at all. You know, I learned later on, I got into a few fights at Baffus and that and, uh, and uh, went to my next sentence. And you had a fight with a guy and uh, you'd be playing cards later on. You'd shake hands and be playing cards. And that's the way it should be. That, that's, to me, that's the way it should be. Yeah. A fight's not a reason to go and kill somebody, you know, yeah. no, which is exactly often, happen- right. often happens now. Yeah. 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 So from there, brother, so um, was that when you were released from there that you sort of um, decided you were going to be a bank robber or did you go back to prison again? Or Yeah, well, well um, I went, uh, when I, I, went, I, I did a, uh, break it in with a couple of guys and um, we got we got a, quite a haul at uh, Lithgow, uh, but we ran out of petrol. I didn't know the car was stolen. There's an older guy, a 40-year-old, who uh, was actually a leader and uh, we got caught... Um, at Lithgow, um, we had, uh, I think it was 20,000 pounds worth of um, watches and uh, clothes, which equates today, that's $40,000. Uh, but in those, the value of it these, this, these days, 20,000 pounds would be uh, probably close to half a million, you know. So it was a pretty good haul, but we, we didn't get any out of it. We got caught. And uh, I went to uh, Bathurst and, uh, there are four of us uh, had to go to court and I just said, look, when we went to court, it was different in those days. Um, the cops, particularly country cops at Bavis, they just had this laid back attitude. No one's going to escape. Where are you going to escape? Where are you going to go? You're, just, you're in jail. Just accept it. You're not going to get very long. But I thought, you know, I'm going to get a couple of years. I don't like it here. Um, let's escape. And they agreed. So we're all going to escape. So you had two cops as took us from the police station across the courthouse. And we weren't bloody handcuffed. So it's unbelievable, the security there to where it is now. So the idea was, I said, look, we'll just shove the cops over, push them out of the way and run for it in four different directions. I said, two of us have got to get away. And maybe all will get away. I said, you know, jump on push bikes, do this and that. Get it. You know, we'll get away. We're in civilian clothes. So they agreed. And it wasn't a bad plan. We come out. Um, I, I remember I got 18 months. And uh, we come out. And the, there were two cops in front of me. The one right in front of me was an old sergeant. And uh, beside him was plain clothes detective, big fat guy. And uh, I sho- shoved the old sergeant in the back. He went stumbling forward and went to his knees and I took off and I said, let's go. And uh, all I heard were the guys singing out, good luck, Johnny. They just bloody stood there. He's pulled his gun out and started firing shots at me. Uh, ripped my jumper off, jumped in a, into a uh, chook pen. Uh, I thought they'll never find me in his chook pen, but they started making a bit of a noise and I said, come on. Us. We quieted them down and got inside his chook pen. You know, about 20 chooks. I was in a little shed. Little, little tiny little shed, and uh, no way they're gonna look for me there. But um, the old lady around the chooks seen it, old Italian lady, and she thought I was in there to get her chooks. So when the cops come around, they didn't come anywhere near it. She come up yelling out to them, pointing at the money, and I could see. So I run out, trying to dive over this fence, rip, rip my uh, finger open. Uh, pretty still got the scared of scar there today, just there, and. Uh, and uh, they got me. Guy was shaking. He had his gun pretty close to my head. And, you know, I knew he was pretty close to shoot me. So they had me, took me back to the police station. Uh, and I said, uh, I remember, I'll never forget, I said to the cop, look, can we get to the hospital and get this finger stitch? He, and he went whack, you know, punched me straight on the head and then kicked me when I, in the ribs when I went down. That, that was uh, the way they operated in those days. Mm. So mm. then I went, um, took me to, Back to the jail, put me uh, in a, uh, and I was I just turned 18. They put me in a, um, this sort of dungeon thing that you went, you went through the wing, they opened up still doors, then you went through a little passage, opened up another door, still door, and it was all pitch dark. And um, they had the light on and uh, told me to step inside, told me to strip off. And it was in the middle of winter, this was July, and it was the middle of winter over here. And uh, they left me there for two days. 
you know, um, I couldn't see. Uh, and you, you got half a loaf of bread and a jug of water. And, uh, you know, it was, if you had claustrophobia, it, it really would be a, a pretty heavy thing to do. It would have driven you mad, huh? Yeah. And they sent me to Goulburn and uh, it was, uh, I went to Long Bay first, spent Christmas in Long Bay, uh, but uh, in a boys' section. They had a boy, because I'd been sentenced, it was different to where I'd been before. And I, I remember spending Christmas in, uh, in a cell with two Dutch boys. They were doing it pretty hard too. And uh, then I went to Goulburn. Now, Goulburn was the first time in jail. It was called Goulburn Training Centre. These days, Goulburn is the toughest jail in the state by far, maybe the toughest jail in Australia. And uh, they've got Supermax there, but they've also, um, it's just a punishment jail. And it's cut up, segregated, all the yards are segregated, different races are in different yards. Uh, there were seven or eight people killed in three years there at one stage in the 90s, and they called it the killing drills. And uh, that was then. But when I went there, it was called Goldman Training Centre. And it was for first timers. But most murderers are first timers. Most murderers kill somebody young. Um, Unless they're a hitman or something like that, they, they, they kill their wives or something like that or they do something and they lose it. They never commit another crime, most of them. And although it's their first offence. So all of a sudden I found myself at Goldman and all these people in there were all infamous. I did okay. I did okay there and just worked. And uh, I got in a couple of fights, but um, not, not with those sort of guys. I got into fights with younger guys, um, you know, over different things card games, this and that. And I remember I got out in, uh, I was pretty bitter when I got out uh, in uh, 62, got out of March 62. And uh, that's when I, uh, I, uh, I did a dual robbery with a guy. I met this American girl, uh, Kathy, I was madly in love with her. And uh, I remember that, um, you know, uh, she was going to America, you wouldn't believe it. They were American, and uh, yeah, it's just bad. All the girls I could have met, I met this girl that, uh, that fall in love with her. I'd, I'd met a few girls, but this particular one, she was going to America, and uh, then I found out I couldn't get get over to America because I had this criminal record. And I, I've written about that in this book here, the Gambler for Love, because that this really got me going on the on the um, bank robbery, really, because um, what what happened is that when I couldn't get to America, um. I did this jewel robbery when the guy got out. And what happened, he waited across the road. I, I walked in and just asked to see all the most expensive uh, diamonds, diamond rings, and uh, just snatched a couple of pads, dropped them in a bag and ran off. And uh, we got away. But I gave them to him. He he had a fence who, who's somebody who actually sells the uh, jewels and whatnot. And uh, he got caught in a pub. He held out on me. Uh, when, when he paid me the money, it wasn't enough to get to America because uh, I was going to try and get their illegal passports and that. And, uh, and I said, look, you should have got more than that. He said, oh, this guy, you know, he wouldn't give us more. And it turned out he'd kept some of the rings and he got caught in a pub trying to sell them. And then he gave me up, gave me up. They come and grab me. Uh, I, I, somebody, uh, he told them where I lived. Uh, I'd just come back from seeing Kathy, open the door. Guy kicked me straight in the face. You know, he was bloody kickboxer. Uh, kick, <laughs> straight in the face and the other bloke grabbed me and uh, they said, what have you been up to, John? I said, oh, what are you talking about? You know, I, I, I didn't realise I was cops. I was, I was really worried. I said, what the hell are you talking about? And they said, no, we know what you did. And anyway, the, the girl identified me. So um, I got three years for that. Did a, two years, nine months. Went back to Bathurst, did it up there. Um, it was pretty hard in jail up there. And when I got out, I decided uh, that's it. Um, Kathy had gone to America. Um, I wrote to her and said, look, uh, I'm out. Um, what's the score? And uh, she said, you know, I'm still waiting for you, you know. So uh, I said, well, don't worry, I'll get there. I'll get to Canada and we'll move, move from there. So uh, I started hitting banks. And uh, they, they wanted, um, I think it was 400 pounds. Then it was 400 pounds for a passport, false passport. And the guy put up bail for me too. I got, got arrested with some stuff and uh, I had I couldn't run out on him. So I knew, I knew I was going. So um, 
the first bank I hit, I paid him back the bail money. Yeah, the first bank was um, Tom Wolf Bank. It's January 1966, uh, probably about 28th, 28th of January, I think. The manager came out and I put the mask in, run, run in, and uh, said, uh, this is a hold up. Um, you know, everybody be quiet. I'm just here for the bank's money. And my left knee was shaking like that. You know, I just, you know, I just wasn't a very cool bank robber at that stage. And uh, my, my left knee was shaking so much that the gun, I was pointed in the floor, it went off into the floor. And it was empty. It means I had an empty rifle. I got two guys here with guns and I got an empty rifle. And I just pretended to reload it, pointed at the manager and said, now hand me a, or the next one will be in the head and hand me a gun. And he did. I said, hand it to me, handle first. And uh, he held it by a barrel and handed it. Had, I still remember it had Commonwealth Bank written on it. And uh, I got the gun, threw the rifle down the floor. Yeah, I got away with that. We uh, we ran off and uh, and out and down through a school, which I knew. Was, and we got through that school. It was uh, school holidays in January. And uh, and uh, we got away, uh, s- drove off, separated, uh, drove a few miles away and split split the money roughly and uh, got away. From this, so, okay, so... You've continued robbing banks after that. So, but that was to get the money to get to Canada, was it? Yeah, you get, you get to America and Canada, yeah. But um, I did, I did one uh, after that, 14 days. Uh, 15, I, it was the 14th of uh, February, 1966. Uh, and uh, it was a day of change over currency. They, they went from uh, pound, shilling, and pence to, they went to, uh, uh, you know, dollars. Australian, you know, yeah. There's one currency, yeah. And uh, so, uh, I did. I did that. Um, got away with that. Okay. Um, got chased there. They come after me. Uh, and that guy in a butcher came after me. Commandeered a car and came after me in the car. And uh, I remember because I'd parked the car across the street and left the motor running. And an old lady came up, tapped me on the shoulder, and told me that I'd left. I left the motor running. I'd be careful. There were a lot of thieves around. And someone had pinched the car. I thanked you very much. It was Valentine's Day. I said, look, you know, man, you know, I'll, if, if I could, I'd go and get you a bunch of roses. I said, you know. <laughs> she said, yeah, you're a nice young man. I said, thank you, man. Then I went over and robbed the bank. But what I didn't know is I'd parked near, nearly across from a bank on that side. And a guy, a teller on that side had seen me and thought I looked sus. And he told the cops, and I saw the report later, he said, I was a bit sus of that guy. And he said, I had my hand on my gun. If he'd come in here, I'd have shot him. So, do you know what I mean? It, it's just fate. It, it's yeah. fate that's yeah. what's meant to be. But as it turned out, I picked the right bank this time. And uh, so I went over and I got away with that. And uh, But uh, they were after me because um, I had to report on bail. I didn't turn up. Uh, they had a pretty good idea. They didn't know for sure. They had a pretty good idea. It was me. And uh, I was on the most wanted list. And uh, I went down to Melbourne and uh, did, did one down there. And... Uh, and that's when they did shoot at me. Um, in those days, you know, Robin Bank was dangerous. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you had to tell us that um, someone would come after you. And uh, I remember I did this one. Uh, it uh, was at Kensington, and uh, in Melbourne, I told the guy, I said, "Look, pull, pull the." Uh, there were two of them in there. Pull the phone out because there was a phone on the wall, and he wouldn't do it. He's pretending to. I said, "Look, pull the bloody phone out." I was getting real aggro because he wouldn't do it. And I knew he was going to ring the police straight away. And he, he did it reluctantly. He pulled the phone out, the, the, uh, out of the wall. And I knew, I said, this guy is a guy. He's going to come after me. And I knew it. And uh, so I turned out, ran out the bank, crossed the road. And sure enough, looked around. He's coming. And uh, he had a gun in his hand and uh, another guy with him. I got to my car. It was parked across the road. It's parked about uh, seven cars down. And I got to it. And... Uh, they got to the end of the street and uh, and I put open the door and as I did he fired fired a shot that hit the uh, hit the boot and uh, then I, I went like that pretend to shoot and they died behind the car I got in the car and uh, started it and then a truck driver saw what was going on and uh, he blocked me off and I just managed to get around him onto a footpath just got around him and he came after me now I I, I had it timed. I was talking about getaway routes. I had a time that uh, 
I'd go down, this is a dead end street, get to the end of the street, and it, there was a big park across there, run across the park at the railway station at the end of the, end of the park. When, they, when a truck driver chased me, uh, I was really angry with everything that happened. I'd been shot at. Uh, you know, I nearly got knocked over across the road, run across the road too, and uh, I just thought, you know, this, what the hell am I doing here? You know, and uh, why, why am I doing this? And uh, when, when I looked around and saw the truck driver coming after me, I said, well, what's he think he's going to do? What's he think he's going to do? So I stopped at the end of the dead end and uh, then instead of running across the park to get the train, I ran back to the truck driver and he saw me come and he wound the window up. <laughs> yeah, that's that's going to do a lot of good and he wound the window up. And I just tapped on a window and showed him the gun and I said, okay, you got me, what are you going to do? You know, and he, he was shaking, really, he was shaking. And I knew, I thought, what, what am I even doing this? So, yeah. So, I just laughed at him and ran off. But yeah, he, I know I know guys who would have shot him. Oh well, so I mean, from there, so you're but you're in Melbourne now. You're most wanted. Um, so yeah, it's on the most wanted list, that's for sure. And uh, well, they got me. Um, they they eventually got me. Um, um, there was a guy that was going to rob the bank with me who didn't uh, pull out, and that's why I did it on my own. And uh, he knew I, I used to go uh, this dancing school. Um, a tread of stairs, and uh, I was learning to dance because I knew Kathy really was a good dancer, and I was, I was learn, trying to learn all the, the, the modern dances. And uh, and uh, he told them where I'd be, and there were cops all dressed as dancers, women and guys dressed as dancers. They ran over and grabbed me, yeah, you know, gun back of the head, and uh, I was gone, and uh, that was it. And they said, well, John, you want it for bank robbery and. Uh, in Sydney as well. So I knew I was in a lot of trouble. The bloody gun I had had Commonwealth Bank written on it. You'd see I wasn't a very smart bank robber. I, I mean, you know, I might have been a bit daring, but I, I wasn't very smart. I, I used to plan them well, but fancy keeping a gun with Commonwealth Bank written on it. Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. You know, I might have been able to beat those charges about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, far out. Oh, okay. So Just what happened stupid, from. Stupid, you know. So what happened from there? Did you get taken straight to Sydney, or did you get taken to Melbourne jail? Oh, no, 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 no. Um, they, they kept me there. They, they. Uh, I, I was like, I met a good cop there, Ainsley. Um, he's a bit sympathetic. I don't know why, but he was, and uh, and uh, so he he kept them at bay a bit. They, they wanted to bash me and do a lot of things. They, they thought I'd done a lot of jobs down there, and I hadn't. Well, hey, what how was Pentridge for you? Um, coming from you know um, your experience of you know pretty much spending most of your adult life in Sydney prison as well. Was Pentridge? Well, like I'd for heard you? about Pentridge. Pentridge, um, you know, even those days was pretty legendary. Um, you know, like Ned Kelly had been there, and uh, and uh, they just caught uh, Ryan and Walker. And you probably heard about that, the escape, and uh, uh, they, they were going to uh, execute. Uh, uh, Ryan, because they they still had executions down there at Penridge. Yeah. Yep. And um, when I uh, when they put me in a van, it was there about three days. They put me in a van to go to Penridge. They put me on a small van and they handcuffed me to this red hair guy. And I'll never forget this as long as I live because I, I tried to talk to him and he wouldn't talk. So I said, oh, okay. And uh, we arrived at Penridge, and you know I, I was a little bit intimidated about Penridge, you know, particularly as I was um, an interstater. And I knew, you know, in those days, there's great rivalry between New South Wales and Melbourne. Still is to a degree. And I, knew, I thought, you know, the screws will be dirty, I mean, and maybe so with the crimps, you know. Uh, I didn't know. So we stepped off the van and I was handcuffed to this red-headed guy. And they only handcuffed us. And they said, who's Ryrie? And I said, I'm killing. They said, step forward, killing, you come with us. So I stepped forward. We, we'd gone about 20 metres, and I heard screaming. I turned around, and there were two or three really heavy-looking crims. I uh, just had this rivalry on the ground. They were kicking him and smashing him and really laying into him. And, uh, and I said, what? they said, you didn't see any. Come with us. So that was that, that rivalry had raped and murdered two little girls. I didn't mind it, you know, I was in D-Wing, uh, it was pretty, uh, the cell wasn't bad, and pretty clean, it was one out, they had us all one out, and uh, the, uh, you had headphones, 
which, you know, something that Long Bay didn't have, uh, headphones, you could listen to the radio, and I thought that was good. And uh, But you were stuck in the yard all day. All day it was cold. It was, by now it was coming up to um, autumn, you know, and uh, I remember it, uh, you had a shower in the yard and you had, the shower was open. Everybody had to go and have a shower in front of everybody and uh, the toilet in the yard, you had to, um, you know, get on the toilet and, uh, in front of everybody. I, I decided to escape and uh, I, I paid this, I didn't smoke and I paid this guy who worked in a cookhouse. Uh, I gave him, uh, uh, I forget what I gave him, but probably tobacco and he, to get some pepper. And in those days, when you went to court, you went in your own civilian clothes, but you weren't handcuffed. So I thought, we'll get to the, uh, when we get to the police, they, they stopped at all different police stations. We'd have a, you have a van full of crimps. Well, they'd open the door and say, Smith, and they'd get out. Well, I thought, you know, the first one they do it, when they do it, I'm just going to dive out, throw the pepper and I'm going to wait. And, uh, but the guy got caught with a pepper and he told him it was me. And they got me and they threw me in the segway. In a, in a, uh, not Segro, in a um, observation cell. It was open. I used to come in the morning about five in the morning and throw water at me because it was open. There was nothing I could do. It would wake me up, bloody dripping water. And then when I went to court, they'd put me in a little dog box on the side of the van and he almost, you know, smothered in there. It was really uh, horrific. I would be handcuffed in this little dog box. You know? And I had, a, had an escape attempt that um, when I went to court, yeah, I had an escape attempt. Um, I got seven, was it seven years, and uh, yeah, seven years, and uh, came out at two uh, two prison guards with me, and uh, I whacked one of them, and uh, got to the door. I had to stop and get the door open, and just got down the stairs, and the guy tackled me from the top of the steps. And we're rolling around the ground, and uh, I just about got him off, and uh, all the cops, the cavalry came, and uh, they give me uh, quite a hiding. And that's why I wanted to tell you about uh, H Division because then I knew I was going to H Division as the tourist. So you would, you've heard about Grafton, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Where, well, well, H Division was the uh, Victorian equivalent. As soon as you got there, when I went down there, as soon as I got there, strip off, bashed with batons and kicked, smashed, near unconscious. Um, you know, I'd already had a hiding at the police station. And, uh, yeah, I was in a pretty bad way. I remember I bit through my lip uh, so I wouldn't have to... Uh, Cry out, you know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't give him the pleasure of crying out. And I bit through my lip, and uh, yeah. Then they took me to a cell, and uh, the blankets are precisely military done, and uh, they threw them in the air and said, "They got to, be, got to be the same way in the morning, or you'll get another bashing." And uh, so I spent, uh, cut it short. I spent uh, nearly six months down there, and it's just, you wouldn't believe it, I went down breaking rocks. I just don't have to break rocks. And we're talking about, you know, the, the sort of coming into the uh, the end of the 20th century and you're breaking rocks, you know, with, with hammers. You used to, you'd go in there, you had to salute them, uh, you had to march, and if you uh, asked permission to take off your uh, jacket and everything, and if you didn't do that, you had to wear it all day in the sun. Uh, you had a big hammer, big hammer, and you'd have to smash these boulders into the size of your fist. And they'd examine them later at lunchtime. And if they weren't the size of your fist, you'd get clipped. So then in the afternoon, you'd get an hour's walking up and down the yard, break, that was lunch, they'd give you a sandwich or something. And then you'd sit on a stool and break the smaller rocks to the size of your, well, with a smaller hammer, the size of your fingernail. And if they weren't the size of your fingernail, you'd get flogged again. <laughs> or charged. Oh, wow. So, so this was mean, H-Division. It, look, it, this is H-Division. And, uh, and believe me, you know, um, people cracked up. They, they cracked up. This was horrific. It was illegal what they were doing. And uh, and they were bashing people every day. As soon as you got there, you got bashed. And uh, eventually, um, eventually, uh, I, I got out after six months, uh, went back and got into a fight, went back down for another two weeks, and then uh, come back up. Then they, then they sent me down here for a week for having a race guy. They didn't like me. They had really had an in for me. And, uh, and uh, I decided I was going to escape again and uh, got to Wee Wing. And uh, in dormitory, got a couple of guys go with me, uh, got a hacksaw blade. We soared through uh, some bars. I got into the middle of the uh, this circle with the bars where we got through that, cut a hole in the door. It was a very weak panel, sliced with a knife, a uh, special knife. 
put my hand down, and I knew it wasn't locked, it was just padlock, and there was a bolt across, put my hand down, pulled the uh, bolt back. Then my mate knocked up for the uh, screw, and he come down. They used to have the keys, which what I didn't know is since the Ryan and Walker thing, um, the uh, in security increase. So he's up there about the keys, so he couldn't get out. He's locked in. I didn't know that. And he came down the stairs, and uh, he's, he went for the gun. I hit him over the head with an iron bar. And uh, he didn't go down. I hit him again. And uh, it's pretty horrific what I'm telling you. But you've got to remember, I'd built up this hate in me that what they'd done to me. And yeah. uh, I used it as a leader to motivate myself uh, to, to do to them what they'd done to me. And uh, so he went down. I got his gun. But uh, then another guy run to the front of the thing and screaming out. And uh, I, I, I ran out there, but he ran off. The sirens going everywhere. They surrounded the jail, spotlights went on. They brought in a special SWAT team. They had 18 cars of uh, police. Uh, snipers shot out all the lights. We, we, went, we ran upstairs and barricaded with, a, with an old organ. It used to be where they'd have church service up there as well. Oh, okay. And we, we, yeah, we were in a siege there. Um, all the lights were on, and then they shot our lights out. And it was pretty eerie. I reckon I aged 10 years that night. And I, I went... Grey, totally grey, um, while I was down uh, in, in Victoria. And um, what happened is uh, we were negotiating, they're trying to get us down, and I wouldn't come down and uh, unless we could uh, do a deal. And in the end, the governor, who had a reputation for his word, they were on the loudspeaker, there was a thousand crimps there right around. They could all hear what was going on. And I got him to give his word that if we went down, we wouldn't be bashed. Anyway, he gave, he gave his word and yep. uh, that if he kept in low court, and that's what happened. Uh, we went down there. I, I spent four years down there, um, but it's kept in low court. And uh, the uh, when we got 18 months, the screws were going to go on strike, over it, but they didn't. And uh, so, you know, they uh, eventually, uh, I got out of there about four months before I was released. There were, there were riots down there. We had riots down there in the end, and uh, we had a Royal Commission in it. And uh, riots over conditions that um, what were happening in, in hay fishing, because you know, we were just sick of the, of the uh, people getting bashed. There have been a few people that re rebelled down hay fishing on their own. Well, they had no chance. But when, when, when they all combined, um, they forced, virtually forced a uh, Royal Commission into it. So I got extradited to Sydney. Um, Cut a long story short, there I uh, was taking into consideration the amount of time I'd done, uh, what had gone through in H Division, and uh, I finished up getting uh, two years from about six months uh, non parole periods. So I was virtually almost out by the time I got sentenced. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, I got out unexpectedly uh, early. I thought I'd do years more. So I got out in uh, June 73. Uh, met Gloria um, and did a lot of things. Uh, played in chess tournaments, won a few chess tournaments, uh, had stories published. I'd, I'd done writing courses while, while I was in jail and uh, I had uh, article story. But you couldn't make any money out of writing in those days. You couldn't do it, Dave. You know, it's, uh, they'd pay you $50 for a story that you put, you know, a week and a half into, you know. And uh, so it was just sort of a hobby in Australia. Overseas is different. But over here, you couldn't do it. <coughs> so I met Gloria, um, got married, um, had a son. Uh, he's doing great. He's over in China now. He's uh, 45, teaches English over there. Uh, he's married over there, uh, a Chinese lady, and uh, they've been married 21 years. Uh, he's going really well. Uh, but Gloria and I, uh, you know, we, we had a great marriage for five years. Um, you know, a few ups and downs because I still, um, I had that, rage inside me about all the things that happened, you know, particularly at hate Division, uh, what had happened there. And uh, now and again, uh, you know, that it came out, but I used to suppress it really. And uh, most of the time I was on top of it. And I ran a few successful businesses. I was, had a shop, a uh, photographic business, writing stories, uh, managed a shop for someone else. Uh, and then I got involved in uh, with a guy uh, who I knew, he'd always wanted to rob a bank. And, uh, it was a week, at a weak moment, I uh, agreed. I, I said, yeah, look, okay, I'll, we'll rob a bank. And I knew a guy had a gun. We planned, 
planned a job it was over in Adelaide because I'd been over in Adelaide. Uh, we'd lived over in Adelaide for a couple of years too. And uh, I'd seen it and I knew it was a lot of money in this particular bank. So uh, I said, okay. But when I, w- when I went down to see him a few days before it happened, uh, he was <coughs> fighting with his, his girl. And there was a needle on, on the table. They were fighting over some heroin hit. And the baby was crying and didn't have any food. And, and I knew, I knew, you know, I, I didn't know much about drugs. Now, this is 1978, but I'd seen what it could do to people. I'd been told that you just don't trust people that they're into drugs as bad as they were. And so I said, I'm out. And I, I pulled out. I pulled out. I didn't do it. They went ahead and did the robbery. Um, he got caught. He got caught with his wife. His wife stepped into my place. Um, there were supposed to be two of us robbing a bank and one driving a car. Well, she drove a car. And uh, somebody took the number of the car. And they got arrested over there in South Australia. Um, he didn't know who the guy was that he robbed the bank with because I'd introduced him. His name was Bill. He didn't know who he was. And uh, they put pressure on him. We'll, we'll let your wife go. You've got to tell us who it was. He didn't know. So he's given me. And I was in Sydney when it happened. This is true. Everybody saw me. I had heaps of witnesses come and said, look, John was in Sydney. I signed a bail card at 8 o'clock that night. This is fair to him. I, I, a bail car at eight, the plane, the only plane out of Adelaide, arrived at Mascot Airport and switched its engine off at three minutes past eight. And, you know, I, I was 40 minutes away at Chatsworth. You know, I couldn't have got there until nine if I'd have been on that plane. It's called the perfect alibi case. But I went under on it, a guy called Rodgerson, you've heard about him, uh, he verbal me, came to court and verbal me and got down to where with a jury believe me or the cops and uh, they, they went for him and uh, I uh, they extorted me over to South Australia I uh, I did three and a half years then I went in the High Court of Australia High Court of Australia Christ all convictions I got out but my marriage was virtually finished at that stage you know I, I was I was raging I was raging and uh, I was very difficult to live with um, you know we had three and a half years separation had a son who hardly seen me in three and a half years and uh, I, I went off the rails. I got mixed up with a young girl, and she's half my age. And uh, we went on a rampage right around Australia, robbing banks, and uh, robbing banks here, robbing banks there, just hitting banks everywhere. And uh, then shoplifting, and uh, did a lot of shoplifting, and uh, made a lot of money doing stuff like that. And, uh, you know, fast cars, high cars all the time, uh, restaurants every night parties, the whole works, just living a fast life. In 84, I got caught. And uh, she got caught uh, shoplifting, jacking, and uh, what happened, um, I saw it and I got in a car and drove, we, we, we were up in Queensland, and I drove to the other side of town to move her car so they wouldn't know uh, where we were. But uh, they, she gave me an hour and they were going to let her go, but they, they needed to dress. And, they, you know, they were conning her, actually, but um, they gave her an hour, and then she told them the hotel. They were, well, I'd just got there to move the car. I'd move the car, come back to get my luggage, and the cops pounced, and uh, they had me, and uh, they charged me with uh, four bank robberies. Uh, I, I did a deal that I'd plead to one. If they let her go, they, they let her go, and she went back to South Australia. And uh, <laughs> she came back uh, a few months later and busted me out, got me, got me out of uh, jail and went, went to the hospital and uh, she slipped me, her, uh, <laughs> slipped, slipped me her, uh, a replica pistol that I'd got her to, to drill a hole in the middle because um, you could see it was blocked. She drew a hole in the middle and painted it black so it looked real. It was a very heavy one. Um, it looked, looked so real once, once that hole was drilled and painted black. And uh, even though the screws, I was handcuffed, the screws had guns. Um, I, I got the drop on him when she, she slipped me the gun and uh, I got away. We were, we were on the run for about 12 months. And uh, she went, went back uh, home and for a little while and uh, they didn't arrest her. And I knew they were, they were waiting for me. They thought she'd leave, she'd leave them to me. And uh, I, I robbed another bank, uh, what was it, uh, in May. Yeah, 20th of May, 1985. I'll never forget it. Adelaide Cup Day. and. Uh, I uh, 
somebody got the number of the car, would you believe it? An old lady, she just thought that, what's, what's that car doing on my street? I've never seen that car on my street, and took the number. Didn't ring the police ring, but when she'd heard there'd been a bank robbery, she rang and told them, I got the number of this car, I don't know if it'll help. And uh, I was going to Melbourne, and uh, the car was worth about five grand, and um, I said to Gloria, look, I've got a car, you can have it. Because I had no idea that uh, anyone had got the number of it. So she came over to meet me, and the cops were waiting by the car and, and got us arrested both. They let Gloria go, but um, they got me, and I finished up. Um, I did about uh, six years in jail over, over, over those banks. Then they extradited me up to Queensland. Um, I finished up. Uh, they couldn't get me to trial, though. They kept stalling, and um, and I, I said I had a good lawyer, and we said, look, what are you doing? They said, we, you know, we've got to find all these witnesses. They said, you knew he was, for six and a half years, you knew that he was coming here. He was going to, and now you're saying you've got to find witnesses. Why, why have you left it till now and keep him in jail? So the judge said, if you don't have these witnesses ready to go in two weeks' time, I'm going to give him bail. They didn't believe it. So I went in, had been in by six months. She said, we still haven't got time. We're in an adjournment. He said, Mr. Killing, how much bail can you raise? I said, oh, 10,000. He said, I'm granting bail, 10,000. He said, you can go home to Sydney. He said, you make sure you come back here. He said, I've got a bit of faith in you. I don't know why. He said, I've got a bit of faith in you. He said, you've done a hard time. He said, if you don't come back, no armed robber will ever get bail in my court again. So I, I had to go back. You know, I had to go back. Otherwise, I'd have every armed robber in, in Australia after me. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> he was smart, man. Smart. It was a smart thing to do. He was a Scotsman. You know. And uh, so, yeah, I went back. Um, I beat through him, beat, beat through the banks. And Jackie came. Uh, she was married then. And he didn't want her to come, the husband, but she came. And uh, we went out to dinner the night before I went to court. I still remember we had a good dinner. And, uh, and I said to her, look, I'm going tomorrow. Going in. She said, No, they'll let you go. I said, Come on, Jackie. You know, so I'm going in, you know, you, you know, I'm going in. And uh, anyway, yeah, they surprised everybody. I beat three, and I got um, immediate two, two years on the other one, immediate, immediate parole. Went back to Sydney, and uh, everything was fine. Um, yeah, but Gloria and I were just friends by that stage. And, uh, you know, I was going pretty good. And then I finished up hooking up with Lucy, meeting Lucy, and uh, she was involved in a really bad marriage. And, uh, you know, I met her at a party, and uh, she'd give me her number. And uh, she probably thought I could get it, but I'm good at numbers. I'm bad with names, but I'm good at good with numbers, and I remember the number. And uh, I rang her and, uh, a couple of times and uh, finished up. She agreed to meet me, and one thing led to another, and we finished up um, having an affair. You know, and she was she was ready to leave him. He was bashing her and doing all sorts of things, and she just couldn't stand stand him any anymore. But the trouble is, she had a, a daughter who was about seven at the time, and um, Lucy and I uh, had an affair probably for a couple of years, really, before uh, before she started to live with me. And uh, there was an old warrant for me in Queensland, and he reactivated it, and. Uh, we, you know, we were living pretty pretty well. Uh, we had a really nice house, a uh, two-story house in Canberra, and uh, the cops came and uh, they said, look, John, uh, we got some bad news. Uh, you're going to be extradited back to Queensland on a warrant. And, uh, you know, she asked him who, and they said the husband had done this, got this done. So uh, I said, look, you know, I'll fight it. They said, you can't fight it. They said, because... If it was just a criminal charge, you could fight it. They said, but it's a warrant from the jail because you apparently broke parole back in 83 uh, by not reporting. And this this was bloody, uh, you know, 16, 17 years later. And uh, they said, You've, um, you're going back. And they said, but we're going to give you a break. You hand yourself in the court tomorrow at 9.30. I think they knew I wasn't going to go. And uh, so, you know, we dropped the daughter off to uh, to Alex, and uh, we uh, we took off. We lost we lost the bond, we lost all the property, we lost everything. Had to get rid of the car, couldn't work. 
uh, couldn't get the doll, you know. Um, so I, I uh, resorted, to, went back to Robin Banks, and uh, she she was still seeing, uh, she was still seeing a daughter. She's going up and still fighting, still having a fight in uh, in the court over to custody, and uh, but she just denied that uh, she was with me. They couldn't find me, and uh, it was a hell of a position to be in, really bad position to be in. And so uh, I robbed the bank, got away with that. Uh, got it. I was gambling pretty heavily at that stage, and uh, borrowed money that uh, from people that um, you got to pay it back. These they don't charge interest if they're good friends. But they, when you when you borrow money, heavy money from good friends, you got to pay it back. And uh, so I had to hit another bank and uh, become unstuck on it. Got caught on the second bank. Finished up at Silverwater Jail and. Uh, she was getting phone calls in the middle of the night. She she came here to live with Gloria and uh, she's getting phone calls in the middle of the night and uh, saying, you Russian bitch, now your gangster's gone, we're going to kill you and you're going to disappear and all that. And uh, she, she was pretty scared at that stage. She'd come and see me. And, uh, so we decided, look, okay, I'm, I'm going to bust out. But how are we going to do it? We're in a maximum security jail. Um, it was almost impossible. I'd looked at the security, it was almost impossible. And she came to court one day, uh, at Queenby, I was there for a bloody traffic matter. You wouldn't believe it. All the charges on mine, I'm, I'm there for a traffic traffic matter. And uh, she had a gun on her. She had a gun. She came in to visit me and, and uh, she showed me. So she had it down there. And she said, I can bust down in court. I said, you know, where are we going to go? You know, I said, I got trapped in, in barrel because we didn't have a getaway route. And, uh, you know, where are we going to go? We're in Queenie. What are we going to do? You haven't even got a car. You know, but it showed you how gutsy she was, you know, and the length she was prepared to go. Um, yeah, she, she was just full on, um, just full on um, partner, right 100% with me that, uh, you know, where you go, I go, sort of thing. And it was a pretty strong relationship. And uh, so I said, no, we can't do that, but by this time, I'd been thinking about a helicopter, and uh, and uh, we decided to do it. Bust out a helicopter from uh, Sawan. Where the stars really aligned, they brought this guy in. He was a con man. They extradited him from overseas, and he was a helicopter pilot who had eight to ten thousand hours of experience, and he was a con man. Guess what? They put him in my wing. One chance in twenty he goes in my wing. Guess what? Get to my cell, one chance in 40. <laughs> so I felt like writing a letter to the commissioner thanking him for his help, you know. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, man, the stars are lined all right on that one, man. Oh, man. Crazy. Look, I mean, you know, you, if you look back, you think that maybe it was a setup. But <laughs> yeah. I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't think that. I just thought, you know, with big things, I'm, I'm lucky with big things. I am. Big yeah. things I'm like, and uh, you know, so because I, I could have been killed a million times, but um, I never was. And uh, I think it was just fate. this thing was fate. I, I, I picked his brain a bit. Um, I read he had helicopter journals, and I read um, quite a bit. Then they, they had illustration of the uh, interiors of a helicopter. And I said, What's this? What's that? What's what's a transponder? And he told me what a transponder was without, without him, without knowing what a transponder is. We wouldn't have been able to do it because the transponder is a silent alarm that goes through to the uh, authorities. This was the risk that if if um, she came for me, we, we only got out in the oval twice twice a week, and it was only for an hour. Now she had to know I was on that oval at that time, and you know, even though I'm supposed to be there, something could happen. There could be a fight. Anything could happen, which would prevent. Uh, we'd just get locked down, staff shortage, whole host of reasons in jail. Uh, yep. That happens all the time. So imagine she hijacks a helicopter, gets over to prison, and I'm not there. You know, uh, yeah, imagine it's the worst stand up date in history. You just. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're going to history books. What I, what I had to do was get out when I got out that morning. Uh, the morning was 25th of March, 1999. I had to uh, actually. You get to the phone. Now, in the morning, there's a big lineup for the phone, only one phone. So I came out and I said, guys, look, I have to ring my lawyer. 
about this court case, otherwise not going to go ahead. Uh, I just need 15 seconds. Well, they, they can't argue with that. Yeah, okay, John. Yeah, well, let me do it. I jump, jumped in. First of all, I went over the screw and I said, um, are we going out to the Oval? He said, yeah, go on in 10 minutes. So I went over, rang up, just got Lucy. She was near the airport at that stage. Said, uh, yeah, hi, Lucy. Uh, look, um, we're going, uh, I'm going out uh, for a jog and uh, I'll call you when I get back. And uh, she said, okay. And she knew that was the signal. You know. So was she it like a tour? Her. Was it sort of like a tour? Yeah, uh, she's doing a tour, yeah. A tour to go and see the uh, Olympics. See, that's why they all came over. All, all the choppers came over. People uh, got these tour guides to go over and have a look at the Olympic site. So and they'd see Sydney, but they'd also see the Olympic site. And so she went to see the Olympic site, but she then the jail was near it. She said, oh, and this is how it came out in the transcripts in trial. She said, oh, is that a prison down there? And he said, yeah, that, that is, just over there. She said, can we have a look? And he said, yeah, okay. So he said, we weren't really supposed to. He said, but I took her over to have a look. And he said, as I, as he did, she pulled out this little Derringer, two-shot Derringer that she had. Um, it's called an assassin's gun. It's big as a wrist, uh, but it's pretty deadly. I was 222 bullets in it. And uh, she pointed out, but he thought it was a toy. He thought it was a toy. And at this stage, he went to go for the transponder. She knocked his hand away and pulled the transponder out and then ripped off his headphones. So he knew she knew what she was doing. So straight away, when she did that, he thought, this is a professional. She had an accent and he thought she was a Russian hit, hit woman. That's what he said. He was going to grab her gun. She she sensed it and she we, we had a submachine gun and she pulled it out of the bag and uh, pointed the submachine gun at him. And that's straight away he just... Okay, what do you want? Flew it down, but instead of just flying straight down the way Bennett had told me that it would be done, he started circling around. He was trying to attract attention to the, uh, the authorities. And by doing that, he got a shot because by the time he got near there, he hovered over the, uh, he didn't land, he, he hovered about, or oh, maybe, maybe uh, six feet, no, not even that, maybe less than six feet from the air, from the ground. I ran over, and uh, as I ran, all the uh, screws see me, and uh, and the crims were playing football. They all stopped. Nobody could really believe what was happening, but the screws ran. But but I had the head start, and the helicopter pilot was beside me, the one the one that um, Bennett, and he realised, said, "You bastard!" He said, "Good luck." He sang out, "Good luck." <laughs> so I ran over, jumped onto the side of the thing, and uh, and I could see him coming. She handed me the. Uh, the machine gun, I just went around like that. It was, it was actually empty. It, it, it had the uh, the firing pin had been cut. So it didn't uh, it didn't work. But they didn't know that, and they all threw themselves on the ground. And the dog squad got there and jumped out of the car, and they pulled their guns out. Then they heard the chow. The chow fired three shots at us. Um, and when the dog squad heard that, they thought I was one of them. They, they threw themselves on the ground. Otherwise, they had a good boot on me too, and they, they could maybe got me. And... Uh, and as I got into the chopper run, I heard, but, but, but. They hit us three times, but they didn't bring us down, but they went very close. They didn't hit us, but they went very close. They hit the chopper and uh, they just missed this cable that runs through and uh, by about oh, half an inch, about, about a centimetre. And uh, if if it had have, um, hit it, it would have brought us down, would have gone down, and we would have been killed. We got away and... Uh, uh, it was a very slow helicopter, and um, when we got out, she'd forgotten the keys of the car. I had to commandeer a car, and uh, I commandeered a car, uh, drove it, let the guy off near a park, told him I'd park it close by, and uh, which I did, and uh, we parked it not far away. Uh, not far from where I lived. I, I deliberately went into the uh, in the lion's pit, really. I wanted to think I was going home, and that's what they thought. So, we, you know, we were on the run for... Uh, Oh, about seven weeks. Uh, it was pretty tough. Um, you know, everybody was looking for that. They were getting 300 reports of sightings a day. They were stopping boats, trains, buddy. Um, and I knew that sooner or later, one of those reports would, would pay off for them. And that's what happened. Eventually, uh, somebody uh, had uh, 
soon recognised Lucy and uh, ran to cops and they surrounded us in a, we were living in a cabin, stayed in a cabin for a couple of nights at uh, Bass Hill and uh, they surrounded and uh, and about two o'clock in the morning, all the lights suddenly went on and John Kelly, Lucy don't care, come out, you're surrounded. And she looked at me, I looked at her, a huge shock, a huge shock. Uh, you know, this is really the end, you know. And, uh, you know, there, there's nothing you do. They, they had specials. They shut the whole suburb down. They had specials swept through there. So, okay, man, that is a crazy story, man. Just this whole thing, man. You know, multiple escape attempts um, across <laughs> state lines. I mean, the oh, yeah. up there. Yeah. And, man, no, Lucy, just... what an incredible woman she is. <laughs> uh, Lu- Lucy's unique. She's unique. <laughs> she sounds awesome. We, uh, <laughs> I said to her, I said to her, look, um, you can beat this, you know. And uh, they put us, and I knew they put us together in the cells, Wade. And I, I got it across to her, well, bug, that's what they do. They bug you. And you, they hope they get confession straight away. You yeah. know? And uh, mm-hmm. I said, look, you didn't do this and uh, you can boot it. And she knew. She's pretty sharp. She, she knew. And uh, I said, don't say anything uh, at all. The cops want to interview you. And she went and wouldn't talk to them without what. And uh, so they didn't get anything out of her. Um, then they put her back next to me. And uh, we're waiting to be taken to, uh, to the jail. And... Uh, what happened is that um, she uh, she pleaded not guilty, but they found her guilty. The jury was out for three and a half days. It was touch and go. But um, in the end, they just found her guilty. It's too much publicity. So how long did you end up doing, man, um, after that? Yeah, Lu- Lucy did seven. Uh, I did, uh, supposed to do 14. Uh, the commissioner decided because uh, I gave him up for putting the pile on myself. It made me do an extra 15 months. And, uh, you know, he was dirty. I mean, they, they tried to keep me in. If they had their way, Creek Service, I'd still be in jail. Um, yeah. You know, parole finishes in about another nine months. I got 28 years, got knocked down to 23 and a half. Um, so I did a bit over about 15 and a quarter years. Uh, then they grabbed me and extradited me back for that old one, which up there and uh, that I'd been extradited for before. So that's twice I got extradited for that. Um, and that... That, at that stage, it was um, what was it? It was about thirty something years old, and uh, they took me back to Queensland. I fought it, and I had ankle bracelet on me and electronic monitoring, and uh, I was out on bail. They opposed bail; they didn't want me out on bail, and uh, so uh, that was pretty heavy. But uh, I lost the court case. The judge said she thought it was pretty impressive, but it had to be dealt with up there. I went up there and. Uh, they were, they were pretty dirty on me up there too. So I, I, went, I did six months, went up there, flew, flew myself up on a plane up there and uh, handed myself in and uh, did six months. They put me in the toughest jail there in Woodford and I got out in uh, January 2014. Yeah. So, so that was after that 15 years. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, uh, so, what, so, you know, after spending, you know, so much of your life behind bars, all of the bank robberies and things like that. I mean, how and prison escapes. How was it for you, man, when you got out after that? Um, after that, after your last um leg in there. Oh, uh, look, I, I adapt. I can adapt anywhere. Really, I'm. Um, I, I just got the human nature to adapt. It doesn't matter where what situation I'm in. But uh, I will say this: in the old days, uh, when you had nothing, you didn't have TV, you didn't know what was going on. Uh, you get out, you didn't even know price of things. It, it was a lot different than that. It was really a lot harder then. I, I think now you're in jail, but you've got television. Um, you've got buy-ups. Uh, you see the price of things. You're not going to be shocked by the prices. You're not going to um, – you see in the news every night. And sometimes I'd sit back there and try and con myself that I was better off in jail because here I am sipping a latte that I've just made eating biscuits, watching the news, all these poor bastards out there stuck in traffic and, yeah, and I'm still having a lean out, doing their block, you know, blood pressure, you know, and break down in the tunnel, they're there for two hours. Yeah, here I am going to watch a movie tonight, uh, I'll get a sexy movie in SBS. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I'm right. laughs> yeah, that's yeah. it. Good old SBS yeah. Friday night, sir. Yeah, but the thing is, watching the football app, but the thing is, 
jail now, um, despite saying that, jail now is very tough at this very moment. Um, they're overcrowded at home, New South Wales particularly. Well, so what are you doing now, man? Well, what, so um, you've got a book on the way, you've written a couple. You know, I do uh, I do university lectures. I've, got, I've come up one there three weeks. Uh, I get paid for that. And I uh, get paid for a few other things uh, that we're doing. Uh, I think we'll do Will Russell's book. We'll, we'll hopefully uh, do a tour, um, you know, and uh, do well on that. Uh, you know, I've still got plenty uh, plenty going for me. Uh, parole won't let me out of the state at the moment, but I think that'll change. Parole finishes next year anyway in September, but uh, I hope to be able to do it before then. But overall, you know, I've got Gloria here. We're, we're great friends. Um, we go out to dinner once or twice a week and uh, I've got a, I've got some really good friends, really good friends. And uh, I'm helping a few families uh, overseas. Uh, uh, one, one family in particular has got um, three autistic kids and uh, they're lovely kids and I, I'm helping those kids uh, get a bit of an education. Oh, man, honestly, man, I'm so happy for you, brother. I'm honestly um, happy for Thank you, you for, for you, you know, what you're doing and... Um, you know, just being able to have a smile on your face after all of these years, man. And, um, you know, I mean, you know, with the bank robberies and the prison escapees, I mean, there's a lot of abuse that's occurred, you know what I mean, during your life. And, um, you know, it's it's it, it, it's 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 a tough system, you know what I mean? It's a tough system. It's a tough system. Be. But look, Dave, let, let, just let me say that, um, you know, I, I did work um, with psychology. I still, I still do see them, but the COVID stopped it. But uh, for maybe the last ten years, and I always thought because you're running, running, running a bank, I knew I'd never shoot anyone. It's, it's, it's not my nature to shoot people, and uh, that so it was all bluff. But it, it's gone across to me, and I've accepted. And Russell has too. We both have that. Um, that when you run into a bank, you've got a mask on and you've got a, a weapon. Then you know it's not you against the bank. You know. The bank doesn't really exist. It's to that extent. It hasn't got any feelings. Uh, you're dealing with the people inside. And some of those people are going to get traumatised. Um, maybe there's 10 in a bank. Nine of them will be okay. But one of them may get traumatised. You could have a, a bad effect on that person's life and the people around them. So I accept that. And that's why I accept that we do get big sentences. I'll never accept that. Bank robbers should get heavier sentences than, than uh, pedophiles because if yeah, we haven't, uh, yeah. if we have an effect running in doing that on people we haven't heard them but we've intimidated them. Imagine the effect that a pedophile has on little kids and on the rest of our life. And yeah, and you know we're seeing it all the time now with Russell's company. We're seeing what what's happened you know, that uh, people people's lives are destroyed. Some of them never recover. Some, some of them dead. It's very yeah. rare for people to actually recover. And even being able to speak on it, you know, in the research, it takes about 20, 30 years for someone yeah, to that's exactly That's exactly right. It takes yeah. that long. And we're seeing that now, people coming forward after so long. So um, they, they will never justify to me why I should get longer or four times as long as I used to, why yeah. I used to get four times longer than a pedophile. Um, Disgusting. So that's what I accept. But I do accept... And I am remorseful. I do accept that I, I have uh, got victims out there to, and there's nothing I can't take it back on. I have um, in, you know, traumatised people probably without even knowing or without a realise. And, and I, you can't take back what you've done. You've got to get on. That's why I'm trying to do good things now and, and make up for some of it. And, and I am, I'm doing what I can. I'm doing what I can. And that's what you can do. That's what you can do. And uh, I really do believe that, um, you know, that, I told you today that I, I believe in fate. I, I think that it was meant to be for uh, for us to do what we did. I don't know why, but I think it was meant to be. And it was meant to be for me to survive and be able to come out and do these good things and write these books and lay it there, you know, for posterity and have a history there and say, well, look, there's my book. There's my three books. There's a book about Russell. This is what we went through. This is what the system was really like. This is not fiction. This is fact. And this is the way it was. And those books will sit well on, on the true crime library many years after I'm gone, you know. Look, Brother John, I think we're going to wrap it up here, brother. Um, man, thank you so much for your time here, man. Honestly, man, means the world. Um, well, did you have anything else you wanted to say before we leave? No, Dave, look, uh, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I, I think um, you're a good interview. You get things out of people. You, I think that uh, you, you know, you understand. And I, I think... Sometimes you've got interviewers that don't understand, and I, I think you do understand. I, I think I think this is uh, why uh, this is I think been a, a successful uh, interview, as was Russell's, because um, you know it was 
if I can ever do another interview, maybe later when we do the book, Russ and I might get on together and perhaps do oh, one with you. Man, I'd love that. Yep. No, we'll definitely do that. All yep. One hundred percent. Good. All right, man. Well, uh, thank you, John. Um, and I believe it's because we're all on the same mission here too, brother. You know what I mean? We're, yeah. you know, it's, it's fate. You know, it's fate that we've all come into each other's lives. And we've it's all definitely fate. It's definitely we've fate. We've got fate. the same mission here, brother. So much love, much respect. And uh, we'll talk soon, brother. Absolutely. Thank you, Dave.